Hi everyone. Again, welcome to this lecture. Um, today we will be continuing the Linux networking uh, topics. This is lecture number four. Uh, we finished the Linux basics, and now we are into Linux networking. Uh, today we will be talking about the domain name system. Um, this is one of the important things that we really touched upon during the first lecture, um, and then now we will be taking it up uh, in much more details. So before I want to, uh, before I go into the um, this domain name system itself, let's uh, recap what we learned uh, in the last lecture, the lecture number three, which was mainly about the file the file transfer protocol or FTP. Um, we learned about uh, how to do the FTP itself by using the FTP and then followed by the FTP server command and then um, there are various commands that we used to transfer files uh, back and forth uh, you can transfer it into the FTP server and also you can get the file into your system and uh, there are various modes by which you can transfer all those things we learned. Um, and then we also learned something that is unique which is um, how to set up an FTP um, system or an FTP site in your um, machine. Um, we specifically we learned about the FTP access dot uh, control or CTL. Uh, this particular file resides in the slash EPC area and uh, this is the main file that um, is used uh, to provide access to any users and here there we use several keywords um, access deny read only write only things like that to make sure that the whoever is connecting uh, to do any kind of FTP activity uh, has all the permissions he or she needs to do the file transfers. Then we also learn some administrative commands uh, like FTP who. Uh, FTP count, uh, the ping command that we all we know about, uh, things like that to see how we can uh, transfer effectively. Um, but I hope uh, it was interesting uh, for you all. Um, and now let's look at some activities that I want you to do based on the last lecture. Um, so go ahead and. Um, uh, actually answer these questions um, what do these commands do in FTP um, bin LCD M put so I think like these are the commands that we already learned uh, in the last class so it should be fairly easy for you to answer these questions. The second one is slightly more challenging uh, is what commands will you use to set up an anonymous FTP. Um, Essentially, like I mean, this is I'm uh, clearly referring to the FTP access dot control. Inside that, how do you, what do you write to set up the anonymous FTP? Uh, some hints I can give you: the when you talk about an anonymous FTP, you don't know who is actually connecting, so you need to make sure that uh, you need to give all the permissions that is needed for any kind of access. So yes, it depends on what they want to access. But I also want you to um, uh, give some idea as to um, how you want to give this um, the permissions. And then uh, the other question, this is very simple: is uh, where will you set up the FTP access dot um, This answer is, I think, like I mean, in the previous slide. So if you just refer back immediately, you'll get it. So again. Um, this question is slightly difficult uh, than the first one. The first one is uh, helps you to get the basic understanding, and this one slightly more. And then, if you are um, still like I mean, if you are looking for more challenge uh, for you, it's the third question, which is the find the number of connections that are available for each FTP server configuration in your machine. So your machine is has like several uh, configuration of FTP. Um, Find the number of connections that are available for each of those configurations. Who are who are connected to those uh, um, those various uh, FTP servers? I think, like I mean, this is fairly easy um, assignment. Um, just um, you should be able to do it in no time. 
um, if you are paying attention to the, the lecture three. So now we will start uh, today's lecture. Um, today's lecture is on um, domain name system, as I mentioned. Uh, so let's uh, look at uh, the domain name system. Um, here we will be learning about configuring the domain name system name resolution. We will also try to configure the dial-up network using the PPP or the point to point protocol and then we will also try to understand the client services such as uh, DHCP and uh, LDAP. Um, these are all like acronyms that we will, we will uh, study uh, later. Uh, then we will also like uh, look at some of the graphical applications and the uh, remote dial up authentications. Um, and then uh, we will also look at some uh, client level tools uh, such as web browsers and uh, email clients uh, because these are kind of uh, you can almost think of them as uh, applications uh, of the VMS um, uh, name resolution system. So first of all what is DNS? DNS is a hierarchical distributed naming system for computers services or any resources connected to the internet um, or even a private network uh, so that um, everyone knows what the other um, uh, computers or uh, services uh, um, are available uh, and addressable. So address is one of the, the key things that um, you know, everyone has to have, um, you have your home address. Um, and so like I mean in the locality people know like um, how to get hold of you to come to your house and they also know your name so they can actually approach you and then they can they know that it is you. So it is kind of it gives the identity of a person. Similarly the domain name service and domain name system uh, you can think of it as a directory where we store the identities of all the people. Um, and uh, the key thing is um, I think like we saw a little bit in the last one the like I mean as you know the the IP addressing that we learned when we learned about IP addressing IP addresses are this uh, four octet uh, numbers which are binary or maybe you can convert that into decimal or hexadecimal um, but the issue is if I ask you to remember say like 10 um, IP addresses from different sites you will soon um, just uh, not able to recollect or recall any of the numbers. So for humans we need something which um, can identify what is a web address for example google.com you need to know what um, like I mean the you need to know the IP address in order to go to the google.com but at the same time what you want to remember is just the google.com and not its IP address. So the domain name system provides a way to actually do this. So let us look at uh, how we do it. So um, in this course we will be talking about like setting up but um, again it is a translation file that is how you can view it as where you can think of the numerical IP addresses on one side and then the actual uh, text based um, domain names on the other side. So and imagine right I mean this you can use it to find um, and locate. Uh, any computer services and devices worldwide this is one of the beauty of internet um, so that uh, you can really find any computer in any part of the world connected to an internet very quickly using the domain name uh, system. So in fact um, as I said it is an address book or a phone book you can think of it. Um, for the internet um, so that that is how you, you should view it all. 
um, some domain name um, like say like uh, example.com um, it translates into address 192.0.43.10 so I mean the DNS will just uh, store that um, that name essentially the that is www dot example dot um, along with its uh, the address so that uh, if you type in www dot example dot com it takes you to that site using the actual IP address the numerical IP address. Um, So closely associated with the DNS is uh, also the URLs essentially like I mean that is the, the names starting with HTTP um, so URL stands for the universal uh, uniform resource locators and uh, essentially that is uh, basically it is a form of uh, um, the, the IP addressing which is which par, um, which which is a, a part of the DNS itself. So on the domain name um, syntax essentially like I mean so we will be learning about it uh, before that let us look at um, the how we do the, the name resolution. Um, the DNS itself is implemented by a domain name server the domain name server essentially um, keeps multiple um, all the all the details, the IP addresses of uh, in the world, pretty much in the world, uh, and its corresponding uh, the textual addresses in one place. Here, the term domain means the name of the multiple hosts in the net, in the internet, and they are that are collectively referred to. The most widely known the domain name is the dot com and pretty much a lot of people will be a lot, lot of people will be working for one of the dot coms and we call it like the dot com era things like that um, and um, an organization can have its own domain or collection of domains uh, the the network hosts um, the names of the network hosts are the host name essentially and um, the FQDN refers to the fully qualified domain name it combines the host name with the name of the domain. So we will see some of the examples in uh, the later section uh, so this is essentially like I mean how you would set up the name resolution the domain name syntax uh, is um, one thing is the the top level domain is always represented at the rightmost uh, um, uh, as the rightmost uh, label. So you can almost think of the the domain name as an inverted um, uh, tree structure. So the dot com is at the top uh, here. You see that uh, the dot com is at the top and then followed by uh, the um, the remaining part in the so the dot com is here and then uh, you can also have the other other items to the left of uh, the dot com so um, let's look at some of the examples. So here there are multiple examples the top level domain name is dot com one example is www.ibm.com which is essentially like I mean com refers to commercial organization for so the first three letters and uh, the other top level domain name is uh, widely used is also dot gov or dot gov. Um, here the example is www.state.gov or irs.gov things like that 
the VOV refers to the government and it is typically the US federal government. Then you have EDU which is the another very common uh, uh, top level domain name. Uh, for example, here it is www.ucla.edu, could be like stanford.edu, several uh, schools.edu. And these are the educational institutions, so that is why the first uh, three letters again that is uh, stands for EDU. Now the military, US military has its own top level domain name, again that is denoted by the first three letters MIL. And any kind of organization whether it is profit or non-profit. Uh, mostly it is non-profit, they have their own domain names and that is the ORG, so it is right here. And then so these were the primary top level names for long 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 time, like top level domain names were only like Palms, Gov, EDU, Mill and ORG. Uh, today the US has opened up with uh, other um, ones like uh, .NET is any networking services, it is not just limited to the networking services, there are many uh, companies now getting the uh, this one. And then .us is another one which is mostly a geographical domain um, and uh, it is exists with uh, the other domains in US and it is also used by a lot of state governments. Um, even though in the California uses also like a lot of uh, GOV uh, names as well. Uh, then there are country specific uh, names, for example, JP Japan, IT is Italy, uh, DE uh, is stands for the Deutsch or Germany, and um, I think like you all know what IN stands for, uh, that is the India. And one of the famous um, domain names in India, within India is uh, airnet.in, um, which is essentially the educational research network. So that uh, goes to a lot of educational institutions. Um, and you can find uh, those uh, several other names like UK stands for the United Kingdom, um, AUS, I think, is the, for the Australia. Uh, things like that, so you, you should be able to find uh, the top level domain names uh, for a lot of uh, these things. And nowadays, like actually, like now they have uh, the the board, the particular body that controls this uh, the domain names. They are opening up in a big way, so there are more uh, domain names that are available today. So. Uh, before we go into the resolver, the, the there is also the hierarchy of uh, domains. Um, as I mentioned, like I mean, when you are reading the the domain names, it uh, goes from um, right to left, uh, with each uh, label specifying one subdivision, and each label is uh, separated by the next label by a, a full stop or a dot. So we just call it like www.ibm.com is essentially you can think of it as the com being at the top level and then under that one of the sub uh, domain is IBM, it could be Intel could be another sub domain so that will be again www.intel.com and then if you want to put more stuff within Intel say like uh, the semiconductor division or say like microprocessor division you will say like microprocessor dot intel dot com so that means that it is the subdivision under the the intel keyword and uh, there are some rules governing the, the names themselves each label can go up to uh, 63 characters the tree of subdivisions may have up to 127 levels, so I mean I do not think like anybody is using that kind of a thing, 
but you can think of um, the the deepest tree that um, uh, can accommodate all these things. So the other rule that also says is the full domain name uh, must not exceed the length of 253 characters uh, in its uh, textual representation. So the internal binary representation of uh, the DNS uh, has a maximum length of uh, 255 octets of storage. But uh, even though like I mean it allows the 255 um, octets in practical practically actually it is much shorter because uh, the domain registries do not have like a lot of um, um, uh, the space that is uh, that is needed for accommodating this, um, um, this particular IP address, and the domain names themselves can contain any character that are that can be representable uh, in an octet. So it is not limited to just uh, alphabets and things like that. Uh, but typically uh, basically it uh, includes um, the ASCII character set that is A through Z digits uh, 0 through 9 and then uppercase A through Z and also hyphen is also can be accommodated. This particular rule is also known as LDH rule which is letter digits and hyphen. Usually the domain names are interpreted in a case independent manner so the lower case IBM and upper case IBM means the same thing. And the, the definition of a host name is a domain name that has at least one IP address associated. So the way to um, convert that IP address is to store the IP address with the corresponding domain names in a text file uh, as I said like this is this is your directory and this is actually located in the slash etc slash hosts file which should be um, you will be able to find it so just underlining that slash etc slash host there are other files that are also being used the host dot com and ns switch dot com they determine the order in which uh, the resolver the resolver looks at various sources to resolve the IP address. Again, as I said, you know the IP address and the whole directory structure is, is all hierarchical, and sometimes you may not have um, the storage space to store everything. So you have to look at these additional files to see where is the the information if it goes beyond the hierarchy that is supported within the. Um, um, within your uh, system. Let us look at um, the configuring the DNS uh, resolver. So, graphically, here you can see basically the host name. Which is uh, Sundance, the domain name, um, I think xmission.com. Again, you can you can see that the dot com is the top level domain name, followed by the subdomain is xmission, and then you have your host name, and then the primary DNS that uh, you can say what is the uh, the domain name system name. And then um, there is 
um, I think by now you know like I mean, okay, these four octets what they mean where what is a network and what is the actual um, uh, host um, ID and then the same thing like secondary DNS also you can specify like so it is part of like two networks and in one network it is named as uh, the fifth computer or fifth machine or uh, fifth node and this in the second one it is actually termed as the second node. So here is um, the web min utility uh, which is essentially like used to um, uh, configure the DNS resolver. This one is again like um, the configuration page um, essentially like I mean one of these tabs is what you will click to get the other one and then configure the the DNS solver that way. Um, so here is how the DNS client itself is configured. Something like this may be like hard to read, but uh, it also gives the same information: the DNS server information, the host name, um, and then there are um, I think like that. Those are the main information that is on this side, and um, that's used to configure this system. But before we go into the next one, which is the dialog network using the point to point protocol, I just wanted to add um, how the address resolution works. So, essentially, like I mean, the um, um, domain name resolvers determine the appropriate domain name servers responsible for the domain name in question, um, and it does so by using a sequence of queries. Um, starting from the rightmost or the top level domain. So a network host is actually configured with um, some initial cache essentially which has some known addresses um, and then when you query to the root servers you get like um, in the Authoritative top level domain um, again um, I'll just clarify that authoritative server authoritative name server is a server that gives the the answers that have been like um, configured by the original source itself so again th these are all like I mean a self spawning system you can almost think of it that way there. The initially the the domain administrator pretty much codes this um, the the domain names into one of the servers, and then from that point onwards it just spawns, and then basically like I mean uh, it actually provides answers to the next server, and then um, that pretty much like recursively it goes on and populates all the servers. Um, in fact, um, if you are doing any kind of web web searching things like that. This is one of the key concepts that was developed basically that uh, when one person gets to know something by recursion you can, everybody else in the network knows about the same thing and this actually helps uh, in doing a lot of web searches where um, the, the material itself what you are searching on will be stored distributed across the network and whenever you want you can easily get it because uh, the the system can use recursion to gather this information and present it to the top level. So the entire uh, directory is also known as uh, registry. Um, so and then uh, there is also like uh, the main registrars who um, essentially registers uh, any key uh, or in fact all the IP addresses. So let's look at the the point to point protocol uh, or PPP PP is PPP is, uh, is one of the protocols that is used to connect uh, to internet 
the uh, model it includes the features that um, uh, that is security flexibility and dependability all of them um, then uh, terminal emulation so emulation is another way that you can use there um, pretty much what is in the remote side you emulate it into your machine and so, so basically it does what the other thing will do or kind of mimics what the other thing will do PPP is um, essentially um, more um, interactive in the sense that um, whatever the messages that you are sending basically they are actually uh, sent to the remote system and executed there. So one thing to note is it's like it's not very sec very secure uh, and uh, used to be like very challenging and uh, challenging to configure and manage. Um, there are two advances that happened that improved the PPP security. One was the password authentication protocol or PAP that stores the user data um, in a file that only the root user can access. Then the second one is uh, which is becoming more and more um, uh, important is the challenge handshake authentication protocol or, uh, called CHAP. This is most secure um, PPP option. So one example will be like your um, RSA or um, um, uh, secure access token uh, token mechanism there it challenges you with uh, either a password or a particular pin number and then um, once you send that pin number then it uh, it starts um, uh, it authenticates you um, some variants of this methodology is um, you will have a pin with a random number generator and this random number generator is actually synced with the server uh, inside the um, system or inside the company and then uh, once you uh, generate a random number based on your pin and um, that is compared against what is generated inside the system because the algorithms do allow the system to be um, doing very similar to what you are doing. So once uh, it understands that uh, once the, the passwords do match then it provides that that handshake is actually carried over and then that is how the user gets authenticated and now he can actually do whatever he wants inside the system because it knows exactly who the uh, person is and his identity has been established. Um, so let us look at uh, how this connection will happen uh, it is a text mode utility called the WV dial uh, that pretty much uh, works to eliminate all this difficulty in uh, con connecting with uh, PPP and this one you can actually use it uh, from the command line in the server in uh, Red Hat uh, Linux there is a utility called RP3 which is provided uh, this is a wizard driven graphical utility so it goes through the various steps to make sure that you can set up the PPP connections. In the Linux KDE graphical environment, um, a, two, a utility called KPPP is used, and then the dial D is also like used to automate PPP. Um, but uh, dial D is um, kind of difficult to use and a little bit more challenging to set up. So here is one example of uh, how do we set the, the PPP connection. Um, so here there are many many options. One is the let PPP do all my authentication, um, begin connection, and the computer is turned on. Um, you may or may not want to do that, um, and then uh, let user start and stop the connection. So this is I think like a good uh, option. So that the machine doesn't shut you down uh, when it needs. And then the other one is the make the connection, uh, the default route 
which is also kind of important so that uh, you receive the maximum of it. Then configure the name resolution automatically which is I think it is a good thing to do like when you are configuring the TVP because once you do the, the name resolution automatically then it is going to a primary source and actually getting that information and then um, it populates and as I mentioned the recursive population uh, will enable that um, the whole thing is populated in no time. Then there are other options for uh, restarting when a connection dies then um, um, then one thing to note is um, essentially like once you set up a PPP um, if, it, if it cannot find the connection it can hang and you can set up the time to wait for the connection to be uh, complete. Finally, the um, it also provides the way to uh, um, configure the primary DNS and the secondary DNS. Then there's, there are some low power features, which is also mentioned here, like bringing the link up and down automatically. So with uh, inactivity time set uh, essentially you can do all these things as well. So here there is more um, uh, dialog boxes this is used to set up an account and starting a connection using the KPPP uh, in open Linux. So as I mentioned like there are other PPP servers. Uh, this in the Linux KDE graphical environment, this KVPP. So it's using the KVPP um, to uh, set up an account and start a connection. I think, like I mean, you you are familiar with some of the PPP and the DHCP because um, if you have any iPhone or anything, you will be working on this uh, a lot. So um, just to uh, give you more. Um, 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 a sense of uh, how this name mapping really works is um, so as I mentioned basically like the network host is initially configured uh, so it has at least some basic directory and then it builds on the directory um, so um, then you make a query into one of the root servers to find the server authoritative for the, the top level domain. Um, then once that is completed uh, that gives you the server for the next level because it ha it contains for that particular top level like dot com what is the, the next part which is IBM and it gives you that um, the corresponding IP address and then you essentially like now uh, the you send a query to the, the server the, the address of the server that is returned. And then uh, essentially, like that, will provide the address of the DNS service uh, DNS server that's authoritative for the second level domain. So now we first went to the first level domain, then that gave us um, some uh, information. We take that information and then we submit to the, the second level uh, of domain name, and then now that is going to return something. If, uh, that's uh, that's all you need. You stop it right there. But if you want to continue again, you can go and continue on with other sub levels as well, whatever is available. So one thing that I wanted to add to the the slide that we talked about uh, where this is domain names um, this one 
so today like i mean dot com um and uh dot net domain names um they use the directory the or the domain registry uh, from very sign uh very sign is the company that keeps these two uh, domain essentially so um they register who is using which domain how long is it supposed to use and also um what are the the dates that the thing will expire so just to keep in mind so let's talk about um, dhcp uh, dhcp stands for dynamic host configuration protocol we learned a little bit um, when we talked about the ip addressing we just started talking about it but um, we will continue in that lecture um so as i mentioned like i mean initially we started with ip addressing the four octet and pretty much like i mean we wanted every um, machine in the world who is connected to the internet have a unique identifier but with just this four uh, octets it's just not possible and not only that um if a machine is connected to a network um then you may want to move that machine to some other place and uh, either replace it with a new machine or not replace it with a new machine but you need more addresses than what is provided so that you can be successful in doing this uh, dns and the other things and then also like you don't make any of the dns uh, dns um um you, you don't want to make them like uh, um obsolete so um the way to do it is this dynamic host uh, configuration protocol which lets you change the ip addresses at the time of installation or at the time of uh, um setting it up so essentially like the dhcp allows the configuration of the service that hands out ip addresses um to the network clients and uh say since like coming mean, you are creating new ip addresses and essentially but it's in under the sub uh domain so that it does not clash with the main domain now um you can actually like keep updating whatever um um web address that you want um all you got to do is to make sure that the dhcp server has that information and um, it's actually like um, so um better so um advantage of dhcp is uh, it can reduce um, the administration cost quite a bit um the dhcp server itself is installed by default on many linux linux systems so you don't need to do any kind of uh, thing for the dhcp server and uh, you can also look at the configuration of your uh, machine in the lab uh, from the slash etc slash dhcp d dot conf file so how do you use the dhcp so again uh, in this section um, dhcp like i mean we can uh, configure the dhcp graphically um, as shown here uh, this is one of the things where uh, you can actually like all the ip addresses that you can give you can give like some um, uh, pointers to the very log and uh, the gpi and then you can let it run so now let's look at the ldap or um, lightweight directory access protocol this provides the directory structure that um, lets the users query a database of network resource information so the ldap directories are organized as inverted trees um and um 
in order to use the directory uh, services, the client software allows the traversal of the tree looking for the needed data. Objects in the same tree um, are referred to using a formalized uh, set of identifiers. So that's pretty much on the local directory access protocol. Now um, let's uh, look at how it is um, organized. So here in the LDAP, you can see that basically there are two different types of objects. One is the container objects, and then the other one is the leaf objects. And it's very easy for you to actually uh, select the container objects. Um, you can see that actually the FDR admin, FDR and font are, from, uh, are uh, the um, container objects and then the, the, the low level items, files and etc. they are the leaf objects essentially. So here um, let's uh, spend some more time to understand how the LDAP works. So here like I mean we have a top domain uh, called um, uh, just called top and the top we have like Latvia it means and then um, then we have also like another one in Mexico um, and there are attributes of these country objects the attribute will be a class is country the name is uh, whatever the name of the states or the country the the um, just the name of the, the, the place itself and then the, there is an internal code um, and then also the capital city so these are the four um, items from the um, from uh, for this particular LDAP um, so like under Mexico you can still have like IBM and Excel and in fact you can also have in Italy if you have ties with Italy um, and then you progressively go down essentially like then it is uh, the um, various um, people under various people various uh, groups for example here there is a CM named uh, Luis Rodriguez another CM is laser jet and then the third one is uh, marketing group itself and then uh, from there you can still go down go down the hierarchy as I mentioned like I mean you can have like all the two levels of logic and um, also like I mean everybody is also trained in the, the those kind of uh, things. So now let us um, look at uh, more so um, how do we run applications remotely so the way that we run um, for example here like I mean you can think of the host name uh, the host computer has uh, just a uh, few programs um, So here all these K paint, K cal, K cal can be paint, these are all um, just the host program. Um, whereas um, actually like I mean I take it back only the first two. Only the first two. But then the remaining programs out of the remaining programs. Um, the GAMP or uh, a paint 
it out. They are more like batch programs, or they are actually they we want to run it under the, uh, this uh, server. So, what do you do? So um, again, um, the number one requirement is uh, we need to configure the remote host before we can use it. So um, we need to tell in that computer as to what uh, the which um, client will be using that resource. So we need to authenticate that. Uh, the user in the remote system. One way to do it is like I mean actually um, there are several like source authentication services that are available. Um, um, a quick one is like the Exhaust Plus kind of a thing where it actually opens up the terminal for receiving any kind of uh, X requests. The XAuth is another one which is uh, can be it's more secure than Exhaust Exhaust. Uh, since it uh, employs the use of a cookie, um, but I think like Exhaust is uh, quite prevalent today. I want you to in fact try some of the Exhaust commands and see like I mean how they work. And then for the remote uh, graphical terminals, uh, the XDMCP will get you the the, the, the remote X servers. And um, it will have a logical login screen or a graphical login screen, and it will be using the X clients. So for remote execution, there are R units that are available. What are R units? We will see in the next slide. But essentially, like um, things like copying or going to a directory, those kind of things. This um, R utilities are much more helpful to connect to a remote machine and then perform this uh, operation. And then the UUCP um, is essentially like I mean that's um, um, the transferring emails over modem between the two mail servers. So the R um, commands that I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are like standard Linux commands. R who is essentially like a remote who, so it it um, logs in to see like I mean what is who is using what. Then R up time is the other one. How long the server is up, um, and then um, so that, that that it tracks that. R login is a remote login. This everybody should be familiar with, which is essentially a way to um, get the um, the remote system respond to your request, which is R login, and then RSH is another widely used command. It is essentially uh, um, it executes a command in the remote computer without logging, and then RCP is the other one, which is uh, uh, copying the files. Uh, so it helps in copying. It does not even copy, um, and then um, Basically, it's a very fast uh, discoverer of. Uh, uh, no, sorry. So, um, so RCP is uh, essentially to copy uh, one or more files between two computers. Uh, um, it could be like either a local computer and remote computer, or just between two remote computers. So, RCP is another widely used uh, uh, command. So now let's look at some of the mail clients. Um, one of the most famous one is uh, the browser. Um, the, so the popular Linux browsers are Lynx is one of them, which is a text-based browser, and it's it actually it comes up uh, free with a lot of uh, Linux machines. Um, Netscape Communicator is still used. Um, and then Mozilla Firefox is another one. Uh, this is by far the most common one. Again, the Mozilla is again another open source uh, type of uh, 
graphics so and then they um yeah they they work on that and other browser browsers are opera dilo galleon skipstone etc um now we go into more details regarding the the links browsers uh sorry the linux browsers so um again um like let's go to this previous slide and then say see like so there are several pro popular linux browsers uh links is one of them it's uh, the text based browser that is installed by by default on many popular linux installation um so let's look at the links browser here um again it's um the text browsers are kind of it's a novelty at this point so we are all used to a lot of this graphical user interface and um working with the browser um this text browser is kind of unique um you can think of it you can see that actually like i mean uh, it kind of types up the stuff and then basically like it goes on and then um the way to interact it is also like i mean there are some arrow keys that you can go to like scrolling up and down um and then um, you need to provide the address in a particular box and then it displays this um a good thing about these kind of text browsers are um, first of all they are fairly easy to bring up the secondly um the text browsers um are much more faster than the, the graphics based ones but nowadays like i mean actually the the processor speed is so much that uh, you don't see any difference but if you remember even the google started as a text uh, um based uh, um text based uh, uh browser and then uh, actually not a browser but at least a web website and then it basically added various um, uh graphics but even today actually like i mean the basic google is just a blank page with just um, one small window where you can type in and then get the um, get the information so um the next topic is going to be the email but before we go into email i i also wanted to um talk, uh, talk about few things um one is on the security essentially so the um, the dns uh, software needs to consider the security aspects of it um there are some vulnerability issues that were discovered and uh, they were exploited by some malicious users uh, there is something called dns cache poisoning uh, in which the the data is distributed the cache uh, resolvers under the pretense of uh, being an authoritative resolver so um basically like i mean it um, corrupts the dns entries so that um, if you're typing the google.com it will take you to some porn site or some other uh, site um and um it also like i mean the once that data gets put in in one of the servers um as i mentioned basically the whole system works in the recursive mode where now when another system another system queries about uh, the addresses suddenly like when you get this uh, this address which is also like uh, the corrupted address and then suddenly the corrupted address um, just flows through the system uh, some of the denial of services also can be uh, uh, can be used uh, or can be can be a result of this kind of attack where uh, you capture the directory uh, of one of the system and then put a um uh, fake uh, uh, url or fake uh, ip address 
for a, for a given URL and then uh, whenever somebody types it in it takes you to like say say like slash no slash go slash no which is like no place so that is kind of the denial of services attack um, again it is all results in this uh, whole recursive mechanism so if we, if we obey it obey and use it properly we can also like get back the proper results otherwise uh, it is basically it's, uh, we can easily uh, manipulate and the destroy the whole thing. So um, once these kind of attacks started coming now um, you know, we are talking about um, the domain name security extension and uh, domain name system security extension or uh, DNS sec or short um, these extensions offer uh, um, some kind of uh, cryptographically signed uh, bits. Um, and then since they are encrypted and that can prevent uh, some of the um, attacks essentially. So now nowadays like I mean there are several extensions that have been devised to make it secure um, a simple thing will be like a HTTPS which is a secured HTTP uh, or the hypertext, hypertext uh, transfer protocol. Um, uh, they also have like uh, uh, some um, spoofing effects um, whereas um, so like I mean this is another way to attack some of the things which where you just change the names slightly for example if it is uh, google dot com this is google dot com somebody can spell another site for google dot com google dot com where if you type that wrongly suddenly like you end up in a different altogether different site which is, which can do a lot of other things. And uh, this kind of vulnerability is exploited in uh, what is called phishing. Phishing is C H I S H I N G. It is kind of an act of uh, uh, it's it's an attempt to actually acquiring information such as usernames, passwords, um, and even credit cards by masquerading as a or a or covering yourself as a trustworthy site um, and so that uh, you can get all this information and uh, phishing even though like I mean right now it is very popular like um, there are several phishing sites and doing all these things this term phishing itself was uh, described in detail in 1987 so imagine it has been around for a long 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 time. It is now famous because of uh, the internet. So, with that, I am going to conclude for tonight or uh, for the, this lecture. Um, we will be um, talking about understanding the email and uh, continuing from this point in the next lecture. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, once again, thanks. <laughs>